Good evening everyone and welcome to the 898 people that we already that have joined us for tonight and to the viewers who are watching the podcast. The Mental Health Professional Network wishes to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands across Australia upon which our webinar presenters and participants are located. We wish to pay respect to the elders past, present and future to the memories, the traditions, the culture and hopes of Indigenous Australia. Hi, I'm Rachel Rossiter and I'll be facilitating tonight's session. I'm an endorsed nurse practitioner with a number of years experience working as a therapist in a DBT team. My experience working in a range of different clinical settings continues to inform my clinical work in Aboriginal medical health and my own um, academic work. Tonight I'm going to first of all introduce each of the panel members to you um, by their discipline and where they're going to be on the panel. But I'd also ask them a, a question at the start before we proceed into the presentations. If you want to know more about um, each, of the each of the panel members, the bios are up on the website and I'm making an assumption that you've already seen them. So I'd like to first introduce Dr Chris Warm. He's now the Senior Consultant for Sefton Park Primary and Ambulatory Care. He's a GP psychotherapist and addiction physician in private practice at Flory Healthcare, Paraka, and has been involved with the development of South Australia's Borderline Personality Disorder Action Plan. Um, Chris, I wonder if you could just tell us in um, 30 seconds, what are your preferred forms of therapy? for BPD? Well my, my favourite psychological approach for, for anything uh, and, and you couldn't say one size fits all but I just really like the, the way Viktor Frankl put it, some people are unhappy in the present not because of the past but because of the way they deal with the present and uh -huh. I, I, I find that helpful in a lot of settings. Yes, so the logotherapy approach is very helpful, that perspective. Okay, let me now turn to welcoming Ellen Sinclair. Ellen has over 30 years experience as a registered nurse and for the majority of this time has specialised in mental health. She currently works as a registered nurse in a private psychiatric unit in the Newcastle area and as a mental health practice nurse in a general practice in the same region. Ellen, I understand you're the author of several chapters in a new mental health nursing text when do you expect the book to um, come out and um, what's the focus of the chapters that you've um, co-authored or contributed to? Thanks Rachel. Um, the book is actually due out in late 2017, so later this year. Uh, it's, been a, a, it's going to be a really, really interesting read for um, new practitioners, uh, for nursing students and the main areas I've uh, contributed to uh, family violence and the mental health of young people, both of which um, I have a, a, a lot of interaction with in, in the GP practice and also in the private clinic. Okay, thank you Ellen and we'll hear from you later again. Thank you. I'd like now to introduce Janina Tamasoni, sorry Janina, um, who's the Senior Clinical Psychologist at Spectrum and Discipline Senior for Victorian Statewide Services. Janina's clinical activities at Spectrum include coordinating Spectrum's assessments unit and undertaking comprehensive assessments and delivering DBT treatments. Over the last 17 years she has also run her own private practice and provides psychological treatment and supervision. Um, Janina, I'm very aware that working with people who experience severe difficulties with regulating their emotions and behaviours can be extremely challenging. Can you share with us one of the strategies that you use to care for and sustain yourself? Supervision, supervision and more supervision. Uh -huh. uh, yes. I, I think it's critical, you can't do this work without supervision and it stops you from becoming isolated and um, allows you an opportunity to process a lot of the emotional responses that you experience in the work. So that's the first strategy for me that I've used over the years that I've been working in this field. Thank you and it's one that I certainly have used and continue to use as well. Yes. Yeah. 
Last but not least, I'd like to introduce Professor Andrew Chen. Andrew is Deputy Research Director and Head of Personality Disorder Research at Origin, the National Centre of Excellence in Youth Mental Health, and a Professorial Fellow at the Centre for Youth Mental Health, the University of Melbourne. Andrew, I'd like to ask you the same question that I asked of Janina. How do you look after yourself? One, just one strategy that um, you use to care for and sustain yourself. Oh, hi Rachel, thanks. Uh, well, Janina's taken the supervision, so which I would endorse wholeheartedly. I think the other strategy is uh, when when uh, facing difficulties is to metaphorically take my own pulse first and uh, uh, to stop and think. Uh, and that the most important uh, thing in in the clinical encounter is to be able to remain level-headed or to step back from difficult interpersonal. Uh, situations and, and to be able to reflect uh, and I think it's a critical skill uh, in treating people with BPD in any setting. Uh -huh, that mindfulness of your own and awareness of what's happening for you and being able to, to as you say, step back. Okay, well thank you for that and um, let me now turn briefly to the um, ground rules for, for this um, session and they're up here on, on the panel. And um, if you find the general chat box too distracting down the bottom while you're trying to, to listen and you're watching all the, the chat, um, you can minimise that by clicking the small down arrow at the top of the chat box. But please use the general chat box to interact with one another and have some fun with it. Okay, so our learning outcomes, you'll be familiar with those having um, read the um, flyer for this seminar or webinar and I'd just like to emphasise that our focus is on how we can work collaboratively together. So each of the, the panellists will centre their discussion this evening on Emma. You will have all had access to Emma's story and in the interest of time let's move directly to hearing from our panellists. So we're going to hear first from Dr Christopher Warren. Thank you Christopher. Thank you. So I think I, uh, I hesitate to quote the US as a, as a leader in some fields, but this was from 2008 and I think it was a, a very good point. Uh, despite its prevalence, enormous public health costs and the devastating toll it takes on individuals, families and communities, BPD only recently has begun to command the attention it requires. And um, I think Australia is... is uh, is also really making a lot of headway. We're, we're um, I think, seeing big changes in, in attitudes uh, among clinicians and hopefully among the general public. But um, I, I certainly remember a lot of instances where um, a lot of clinicians are fairly wary, if not uh, um, critical. And, and uh, so hopefully this evening just helps people be that little bit more familiar and hopefully um, feel like there are things we can do and, and things that help and uh, I guess as a GP we, we also have the, uh, the advantage that we, uh, we, we may be expected to, to deal with virtually every imaginable condition. We don't officially have to deal with them all single handed so sometimes the, the challenge for the GP is to work out when have I reached the limits of my capabilities, when should I get somebody else to help and of course that will depend a lot on where you're practicing so there are some things that are easy to say from a from a, an urban setting, and and uh, probably a lot more of a challenge from rural and remote settings. Um, but given that I've also got a particular focus on um, alcohol and other drug issues, and and perhaps other things that fall under the addiction area, sometimes uh, whilst it's good to deal with the the formal psychiatric part of things, there's also the whole notion of harm minimisation and. Um, so sometimes there might be somebody who in the context of BPD also has alcohol dependence or opiate dependence. If they've got alcohol dependence I'd be keen to see if they are having some firemen. If it's an opiate dependence then I'd look at whether they're willing to go on something like buprenorphine or methadone and uh, obviously in different states there are different rules and different routines. Um, and yeah I think the, the debriefing perhaps is as close as a lot of GPs will get to the supervision um, and sometimes we'll need to try to make sure our colleagues and, and other, other clinicians don't get too worn out and demoralised and sometimes 
they'll uh, they'll boost our uh, our spirits. Um, quoting a bit here from from sane.org, they they used to have a really neat little one page handout that I would sometimes show patients, and and a lot of patients who hadn't yet been confirmed as having borderline PD would would look at it and say, yeah, that's that's me, and they found it in fact very helpful. Uh, I think people have historically been afraid that if we say someone's got borderline PD that they'll be offended, but if we um, express it respectfully and give clear explanations and, and if it carries with it a sense of hope, um, I think that's, that makes a huge difference. So the whole notion that people with BPD can get better. Um, and I think um, DSM-5, the good old American Psychiatric Association, fifth edition of the uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, one, one thing that they've really, really changed in terms of personality disorders is to say that these are not that different from any other kind of psychiatric disorder. So it's not as though there are the desirable, respectable access one conditions and the not very nice, undesirable access two conditions. That distinction officially has gone and uh, let's hope we can all start to see that this is like a lot of other conditions. Um, some of the things that were there all along in DSM-4, uh, this is a condition that typically involves impulsiveness, risk, risk taking. Um, my interest in Viktor Frankl, when somebody talks about chronic feelings of emptiness, having trained in an approach that looks for ways people might find meaning and purpose in their lives, that, that struck a chord for me. But there's also this paradox that a condition where people don't want to be left alone, where people want support and companionship and um, sadly sometimes the uh, the behaviour of people with borderline PD may mean that they are harder to be with than other people. So they don't want to be rejected, they don't want to be abandoned, but then they do things that make anyone cringe and it can be a, a, real, a, a real struggle. And of course that emotional intensive, um, the, the intensive uh, distress, uh, we, which often again leads people to, to try and numb their feelings with the uh, with the alcohol or the other drugs, or sometimes taking away the distress through self harm, which of course is also something daunting. Um, now, I'm not necessarily saying this is something everyone can do, but uh, it's just nice to know that in addition to some of the more specific uh, techniques, um, there's also a, a a less specialised approach, but one that I think also has a lot of appeal called good psychiatric management. And certainly in general practice, um, it's going to be pretty hard for most GPs to set aside uh, an appointment once a week. But by the same token, there, there are some people who, if we plan to see them and, and give good treatment, treatment and support, they, there may be a lot less instances of them coming into the emergency department or turning up in crisis, so planned regular supportive visits might be quite useful. In the GP role, if anyone needs to get to the bottom of what started this, it's probably not the GP. And I think even the uh, the psychological treatment experts would often say they may not always need to get to the bottom of it or find out what was the original trauma. There might well be an original trauma but it may not be necessary and sometimes it may actually be positively uh, counterproductive to, to dig and, and look too much into the past. Um, so I think um, I will finish with a slightly cheeky quote, um, uh, simply extrapolating evidence from studies conducted in patients with severe chronic or complex disorders encountered in specialist treatment centres may not only be scientifically questionable but may particularly annoy GPs. Uh, and providing, providing a detailed list of reasons for referring to a specialist, that's okay if you've got a whole lot of specialists saying, please, please, I'm bored, I've got lots of vacancies and time on my hands. But um, I think most of us know that that's not how it usually works. Uh, and one of the people that I was really most satisfied to work with uh, was sent to me as a GP with an interest in mental health a long time ago by the Court Diversion Program and it was only after I'd seen him for a couple of years that finally the local public sector mental health team said, oh, perhaps we should see this man as well. Uh, and, and by that time, he'd had several hospital admissions with traumatic, traumatic uh, suicide attempts and 
all kinds of problems. And with a whole lot of people helping, uh, and a colleague of mine initiating Suboxone and some other medication to help with his alcohol dependence, this, this man's whole life has turned around and he's um, living independently and I think his quality of life is a whole lot better. I better let uh, the next speaker take over, but uh, thanks for listening. Okay. So um, thank you, Chris, and I think you've highlighted well for us some of the challenges um, in GP land of um, working with people who perhaps don't fit the, the criteria for the um, complex services or the um, specialist services as well. And um, now I will invite Ellen to tell us and talk to us about how she'd actually interact with Emma and the um, from the mental health nurse perspective. Thanks, Ellen. Thanks, Rachel. Um, I've I've approached this uh, from a perspective of Emma actually being one of my patients that I've had referred to me from one of my GPs. Very typical um, presentation. Probably not the the most distressed person. Um, so the first slide there is basically the approach that I take. So we, we approach it as a team. Uh, so Emma would be working, it would be made very clear to Emma that she's working actually with the GP and myself in finding a way to relieve her distress and to find some answers. Uh, so uh, the approach I would generally take is looking at therapeutic engagement, um, looking at her current safety, what level that is, looking at any medication she might have on board or not, um, and of course looking at the biosocial, uh, psychosocial assessment and, um, and setting goals with her and the monitoring. And I just wanted to make a point at the bottom there that I devote 50 to minutes to an hour to a new patient. So if I saw Emma for the first time, that's how long I would actually meet with her. So I've got the information given to me uh, by the GP and that versus uh, quite often what the GP can spend with her, which might be six minutes to, to 15. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Wrong way. All right. So, of course, the therapeutic engagement uh, with in mental health nursing um, is the crux of the of the relationship. So we put a lot of work into that. It's not a linear process. So this is something that's ongoing through my interactions with uh, with Emma. And in part of that engagement process, I would be actually looking at being very clear to to Emma, not only hearing about what she needs, but what I can provide. So um, very early work on boundaries, um, knowing her history. Knowing also that there is no diagnosis at this point, so I only know a little bit about her history um, and what some of her, uh, you know, major things have happened in her life. So I'm only getting uh, a clue about how to progress with this and, and work out what Emma actually needs. So I would explain to her that I can assist with facilitating access to psychologist support groups. She has young children. She may need family assistance. There may be various things in the community she doesn't know anything about that could help her. Um, there could well be uh, some follow-up needed. So if she is um, actually referred off to a psychologist, if she identifies areas that she would really like to do uh, work with that requires, um, say, a psychologist intervention or you know, someone that we discuss together that would be most appropriate, then that's, uh, that's the direction we'd take. But as we know with people with ongoing distress related to how they interact, their, um, their personal relationships, the way they manage their emotions, this could be an, a, a long-term ongoing need that she has. Therefore, there's a very good chance that I'll see her back. The GP certainly will. Um, and of course, right throughout that, she's had a lot of awful experiences. To, uh, to give her that recognition that how she's feeling in reaction to what has gone on in her life. So to validate, 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 and again, validate is really, really important. So the GP is going to be very, very interested in her safety. So she's come with um, thoughts of uh, suicide. So that's, of course, the first thing that I need to, um, to check out with her. So thoughts of self-harm, she has had some history in the, in the background there. So I would be very direct with that. Um, a lot of us know how to do a suicide assessment, but 
you know, we need to know the plan, the means and how strong the urge is. As we know, a lot of people with um, borderline personality disorder or borderline traits uh, have that suicidality at the back of their mind. It's, it's quite chronic. I'm not sure at this stage whether Emma is like that, but it's certainly a question I need to ask. And I also need to look at her protective factors, what she recognises as the strengths in her community. So um, whether that's her family, whether that's a friend, um, just checking out exactly if that's her feeling about herself as a mother. We know she has uh, some anxieties around that, but it, it could be an area that you could explore to find out if there is some uh, positives in that for her. So, and she could be very, very well aware that she's the main person in her children's life. Um, and of course, if I uncover the fact that she's uh, in acute danger with her suicidality, then of course I need to uh, contact the acute mental health services if she's in crisis. So assuming she's not in crisis, I would have a bit more of a conversation with her and, and anyone who presented with her circumstance as, as their medications. As we know, there is no medication particularly for borderline personality. But of course, she may have been prescribed um, things by someone else for anxiety, for depression. Very likely they didn't help, particularly if there were no other uh, psychosocial um, therapies or anything used along with that if she had no support, asking her from her perspective why she stopped and whether it made any difference whether she stopped, um, whether she told anybody. Um, it might be a good, a, a good time to, to ask about does she have medication left at home? Is that something that she's put aside just in case she needs it? Um, does she use over-the-counter medications? Does she use drug and... Has, has she used any drug and alcohol uh, to cope. So very important area to cover. The psychosocial, biopsychosocial as, as assessment, of course she needs a chance to tell her story. And through her story, we would identify her strengths, identify her priorities for treatment, um, set goals for herself and work out, give her a very, very clear understanding and, and a structure that she is supported, that we have a place to go and that she is welcome to come back, that, uh, that we give her realistic hope for the future um, and that she feels welcome back again, that she can come and ask questions, that she can come and seek help again. And I think my five minutes is up. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. And um, we're going to move now from having looked at um, listening to Christopher and now Ellen on to hearing um, Janina's perspective as a psychologist. Thank you, Janina. Good evening, everybody, and thank you to the previous speakers. Um, I feel like some things that I've got my slides have already been covered, so when I was looking at this case study, I was imagining, actually, this is probably not the type of client I would see in my public work, but certainly is not uncommon for the sort of client that gets referred to me in my private work. So I was thinking about the group of psychologists within the community that often receives referrals from GPs, particularly through the Better Access Program, and where it's very clear that um, the person generally has a, you know, a referral saying that they're depressed. So I think it's really important um, in this instance with Emma not to immediately assume, sorry, I should move my phone, um, to assume that she has CPD. I think a, a, a thorough assessment is important. For me, when I'm working privately, this might take a couple of sessions. Um, so in that assessment, if um, you don't feel you're self-confident to make the diagnosis, you can refer to that. But there are a number of self-report measures that you can use. Um, I certainly like using the diagnostic interview for borderline to advise by Gunderson. I find that very helpful. But there are some shorter 10-item self-report measures that you can use as a screen, which can allow you then to move on maybe to a more formal diagnosis. So some psychologists, clinical psychologists in particular, will feel um, more confident possibly to make the diagnosis, not necessarily though. Um, I think the other thing to do with Emma is she's come in saying she's so in your referral, states that she has some ideation around suicide. I think it would be really important to do a, quite a thorough assessment of her self-harm, both in the past um, and any current ideation around 
self harming behaviour or urges, um, and also in relation to suicidal thinking. It's been said already that the, there is chronic suicidal thinking that occurs in people with CPD as a, has a function. So we don't want to panic if she starts talking about suicide. And I think that's one of the big problems that happens is people panic and feel like they have to put a whole lot of um, urgent interventions in. Now clearly if there's imminent risk, we need to do something. I think the other important key here and, and from experience I know is to consider any risk to the children. Particularly if her mood is low, she's withdrawing, is she able to attend to her children? Is there any risks there? Strengths, weaknesses, we've talked about so her, her strengths is really um, important but also looking at what some of their skill deficits might be. Um, one of my, I guess, bugbears really that happens is a lot of clients um, might get this diagnosis but never get informed about what it actually means. And for me, when I pro provide psychoeducation, I like to think about how I'm going to provide the DSM criteria in a more helpful way. So I tend to talk about it as a, dis a disorder of dysregulation. And then I cover the sort of areas of dysregulation. And the core fundamental feature is really emotion dysregulation. And the other behaviours, like behavioural dysregulation, cognitive dysregulation, dysregulation of interpersonal relationships, and dysregulation of self, all stem from that fundamental core of dysregulation. I found that that's been a much more helpful way to engage the client. They find it much more accepting, less pejorative, and it gives a way forward. Okay, I don't have these skills. I'm doing the best I can with what I have, but maybe I can start to make some changes in this area. So then I would talk to Emma about what really would be the treatment that's indicated for her and what, what we know from an evidence base is the most effective. And I haven't listed all of those, but there are a number of evidence-based treatments. Um, from, most people know about DBT, but we have DBT, we have um, CAT treatment, cognitive analytic treatment, mentalization-based therapy, um, acceptance and commitment therapy. There's some data now for that. Um, it's, there's not as many studies in that area, but it certainly has some utility. There's senior therapy. Um, there is, as previously said, um, by Chris, there is um, Gunderson's notion of um, psychiatric management, um, which has got a supportive element to it. So there's a number of different CBT, but the CBT has some limitations, particularly around education. So I think thinking about what you can actually offer is going to be really, really important. But supportive therapy can also be important. Um, I'd also think that it's important to, even though her husband is saying he wants to have a marriage, he, he can be incorporated into this. I think that's um, a really important element. Then if there's a, an agreement that you're going to treat her or provide her with some psychological treatment, I think um, really focusing on engagement is going to be important to, to really enhance outcomes. And so when we're talking about engagement or therapy for alliance, we're talking about a number of different forms of uh, alliance formation and they take time to build. So we have a contractual, a relational and a working. And the first part around contractual alliance or um, engagement is where we're setting up the structure of the treatment that we're going to offer. And I think this is very, very important. It sets out to Anna things like what the agreed treatment goals will be, developing a crisis plan with her, the frequency of your session, um, your limits as a therapist, some expectations. Um, and in relation to the limits, might be things like, you know, can you accept calls? Don't you accept calls? These sorts of things. So that's really about setting that contract. Now sometimes that can take one session, sometimes it may take two sessions. And hopefully over time we start to move into a relational sort of alliance formation. And that's where Emma's experience with you as a caring, empathic, genuine, interested, curious, and non-judgmental therapist who can validate or follow. Um, you're much more active in relational um, engagement or alliance formation. And you're also very consistent and reliable. And this is going to be important for her. You're open to repairing any ruptures that might occur in your life, making sure you can communication is understanding. So then we go to working alliance. This normally develops 
pretty much, much later down the track, about six months, maybe 12 months, and this is where someone like Emma can start to be in a really strong collaborative relationship with you, where she can manage um, any observations that you might feed back to her as a therapist, and she can experience them as well intended, not as rejecting, not as malevolent, not as abandoning, those sorts of things. Then um, the other part to the work, so it's the communication style, I think, of, of the therapist is really important here, so being clear. Um, and being clear means communicating what you understand about a situation, legitimizing the facts of her experiences, explaining your own feelings, and expressing your understanding about her difficulties, acknowledging her situation, and maybe the situation that others in her life are experiencing around her, and respecting her emotions, etc. And then I think the other important thing is developing a collaboration with those that are working with her also, the GP, the mental health nurse, I think it's really important. Um, and she needs to know that there's going to be an open dialogue and discussion there. So we have some clarity around our roles and our responsibilities that might include how we're going to respond to crisis. And you might want to support her to think what other sorts of support she needs also to boost her capacity while she's seeing you. Um, right, sorry. I, I put this in because I thought this was really important. That sometimes as psychologists we forget some of these difficulties that emerge and then we have an action urge which is to refer the client on. Um, and that's very common in people who have the borderline personality uh, disorder. So we haven't set up a contractual alliance in the beginning with her. So she's unclear about what I can I, can I um, have oh. Yeah, it cut you off. Okay, so people can see uh, the slides. And um, so I think it's just being really clear, but most importantly, you managing as a psychologist to have supervision, recognizing your own biases, and getting as much training and education. I think that's fundamentally critical in helping someone CPD. Okay, thank you, Janina. That's such Sorry. a huge topic, isn't it? And there's yes. um, so I'm much that we'd like to say, but we've got very limited time. So let's move on now. Um, to hear from Andrew and hear the psychiatrist's perspective. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Rachel, and thanks to the other presenters uh, who've really uh, done my job for me because they've outlined a lot of uh, the important issues. Um, what I, what I want to highlight is that should Emma get to see me as a specialist, then she's likely to have jumped through a number of hoops and present some form of complexity. And while on paper, uh, as Janina said, uh, Emma might not necessarily present to a specialist. She will present to a specialist uh, when, there is, when there are complicating features. And there are a number of elements to her story that suggest that as well as having uh, some level of personality disorder, she also gets intermittent mental state disorders, uh, such as depression. Uh, and so it's important to um, be able to tease those apart in a good enough assessment. And essentially, uh, as a specialist, what I would be doing is identifying that there is personality disorder present, uh, describing the flavour of that personality disorder, then identifying any other co-occurring mental state pathology, and then overall estimating the level of impairment, uh, which would then help me to direct uh, the treatment options, and any assessment needs to engage the person in, in treatment. Uh, so you need to balance inquiry uh, with uh, relationship building. And when looking for a personality disorder, what I'm looking for is a personality structure that prevents a person from achieving one of the basic life tasks, that is uh, a stable and integrated representation of themselves or others, the capacity for intimacy, attachment and affiliation, and a capacity to function adaptively in the social group, that is develop pro-social behaviour, and or cooperative relationships. And you can see from that, by that definition, then Emma does have significant personality pathology. The significance of borderline pathology that I would be looking for is that it's a marker for severe personality disorder. Uh, it's it, it's the, really the general severity factor in personality disorder. And Emma certainly uh, displays a number of the features, although at relatively low levels. What she emphasises is that the threshold in the DSM of having any five out of nine personality disorder criteria is really a bit of a nonsense. Uh, and 
In fact, people with low levels of personality pathology, particularly borderline pathology, can have very significant problems and often get shortchanged in the mental health system. So teasing apart that complexity is an important part of the um, specialist approach. And in distinguishing state from tray, uh, because the, the mental state disorders might need quite specific treatment, I'd be looking for the longitudinal pattern of her presentation, usually at least a couple of years. By the time she's 35, you'd want to be having many years of presenting with a particular feature, and it needs to be the usual way that she behaves. That is not restricted to those times in her story when she was very low uh, persistently for periods uh, that might have been weeks or months, but actually this needs to occur also outside of those times. And it can be very helpful to draw a timeline going back over some of the events of the last couple of years or anything up to five years and trying to identify times outside of major depression or severe anxiety disorder or out of control eating when she was also displaying those uh, uh, personality disorder features. In offering treatment, uh, the previous speakers have really covered a lot of the important aspects, but I think the key thing that uh, I want to emphasise is that treatment needs to be structured. There is no evidence to say that any of the brand name psychotherapies is superior to any other. What they all have in common is that they are structured, that patients are encouraged to gradually assume responsibility as treatment progresses. There's no kind of tough love from the beginning. Uh, that people are uh, assisted to connect their feelings to the actual events and actions in their life and that the focus of all the contemporary treatments is on the here and now, going right back to uh, Chris's uh, presentation at the beginning, not delving into the past for the sake of it, but actually focusing on problems in the here and now. And all the empirical treatments, all the uh, evidence-based treatments are collaborative, they're active, they're responsive, they validate the uh, experience of the individual and they're empathic in response to distress. Uh, and these are really key features of any treatment. Uh, and then supervision we've, we've covered, but I just want to emphasise that we all are people and uh, personality disorders at their core are relational disorders. And so this uh, patient group can be taxing uh, to sit in a room with week after week and we all will have responses. It's important to be able to stop and think about those responses. As I said, take your own pulse rather than just enact uh, your impulses to uh, get into an argument or, or uh, reciprocate whatever the, the problem is that uh, the, the person is presenting. And the kind of generic therapeutic processes that, uh, that I would use and most specialists would use involve things like containment, keeping people safe, taking responsibility for them when they're not able to do so. That's a dynamic process. Sometimes you need to step in, sometimes you don't. It's also always important to let the person know what's going on and talk them through when you are stepping in. Uh, support, uh, structure, again, uh, very important. Uh, and involvement in the, uh, in the treatment, that collaboration with the patient is a vital part of uh, of all the successful treatments. And the, the uh, patient gets to practice new relational skills with the therapist uh, that they can then build on and develop uh, in their life. Uh, and then the real aim of all of this is improved quality of life and improved functioning. Uh, the features of personality disorder actually get better over time whether you do anything, anything or not. The reason uh, to intervene is to accelerate the improvement of that psychopathology but really importantly to ensure that they are able to manage, better manage relationships and to have a vocational pathway through life that they can have uh, uh, successful uh, uh, and prosperous interpersonal relationships and that they can have meaningful activities in their life. I want to give a plug here for um, uh, an app that was developed uh, by a colleague of mine in Melbourne, Glenn Melvin, out at Monash University, uh, which I think is a, a really useful tool that anyone can use in their day-to-day -day work with people with borderline personality disorder. It's a safety planning app. It's based on Barbara Stanley's work 
uh, and he's developed it into an app. It's available free in uh, in any of the app stores. Uh, it was uh, uh, supported by Beyond Blue, and it is a very simple and effective and evidence-based way of supporting people to plan for uh, crises and difficulties. And so I would commend, highly commend that to you. And then finally, uh, specialists also work in multidisciplinary teams, and, and this is the program that I've developed at, at Origin uh, in Melbourne. Uh, and just to show you that the treatment, the multidisciplinary treatment of borderline personality disorder is complex, and it's clearly unrealistic, as uh, Chris's first slide or first set of slides said, to just extrapolate these treatments into primary care. But it is important to know what these treatments involve that they are complex and time consuming uh, and that they require a team that is working together with a shared model uh, and that they need to integrate clinical case management, individual therapy uh, and general psychiatric and medical care. And importantly, some of the key tasks that I would be doing, uh, trying to reduce polypharmacy, involve the family, I'd include Emma's husband in that, ensuring the safety of her children, uh, and then uh, psychoeducation about borderline personality disorder or personality disorder in general being a disorder uh, uh, along the lines that I outlined earlier of, of a failure to develop uh, adaptive responses to the basic tasks in life. Uh, and then uh, I think a very important role of specialists in this area is advocacy for people with BPD. Um, the, the greatest source of stigma and discrimination in borderline personality disorder is sadly from my colleagues uh, and from the mental health system in general. And it is important to advocate to uh, have optimism because there is good reason for optimism, evidence-based optimism, uh, and to counter the soft bigotry of, of low expectations that people have for people with borderline personality disorder, that we should be expecting uh, really... Uh, good recovery uh, and uh, good vocational outcomes for people with borderline personality disorder, not that they are simply not turning up to our emergency department and annoying us. Uh, and importantly, we need to counteract discrimination when our colleagues say bigoted and disrespectful things about people with borderline personality disorder, I make a point of standing up. Uh, to advocate for leg the legitimacy of the diagnosis and the legitimacy of the experience of people with this disorder. So that's uh, my presentation. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Andrew. And um, we've covered a, a lot of territory in a short period of time. And as I've looked now at the questions and thought about what we've covered, I think that one of the things that often troubles um, clinicians is how to support the family um, and what, how they actually work with family and the person that's um, suffering and distressed by their um, difficulties. And I wonder if I'd open that up to the panel and um, if one of you would like to respond to or elaborate on that question. Well, it's Andrew here. I, I'm happy to elaborate. I, I think families are the greatest asset that we have in working with uh, people with borderline personality disorder. And in borderline personality disorder, it's really the last disorder to shake off the kind of family blaming um, uh, stigma that has afflicted many psychiatric disorders. And it's absolutely true that many families struggle to manage uh, and in some families uh, that the relationship has broken down irreparably. But if you, uh, if you diagnose early and treat early, mostly families are intact or in contact with one another uh, and that engaging the family uh, is a key part of recovery and often uh, they are the only people sticking by uh, the person that you're treating. So uh, involving them seeing them as allies, not the enemy, is really a, a vital part of, of this. Being honest about the diagnosis, being honest about the family difficulties, uh, and very occasionally, and it's the exception, not the rule, if there is uh, a, a relationship that is damaging or dangerous in the family, only then would, uh, would I be advocating 
uh, to step in and protect the uh, uh, person with BPD uh, from a family member. But that's actually um, not the norm in borderline personality disorder across the population. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, I think you've um, given us a really helpful perspective on that. You've also addressed the importance of diagnosing early and I guess as with most um, psychiatric or um, mental health issues that early intervention is going to make things a lot easier um, or a lot more hopeful. Um, I wonder, you made mention of people who um, as they get older their behaviour um, often I guess moderates. What's your experience then, and perhaps other panel members have a response to, for the person who's, as they've got older, their behaviour may have moderated, but what's happening with their um, emotional suffering? Uh, that's a really good question because actually what, what happens is there is a natural rise in, in borderline pathology following puberty, and it actually peaks in about the teens or 20s, and then it declines thereafter. And most people with BPD, unlike what we thought in the past, will not actually um, continue to meet the criteria even a couple of years later. Uh, and, and so the diagnostic criteria drop off pretty quickly. But they, they live lives of quiet desperation and often their suffering is much more internalised. They often discover that the best way to protect themselves is to withdraw from people and so they often become more reclusive. Uh, and and so they're often living quite uh, uh, distressed uh, and um, uh, demoralised uh, lives, uh, often quite disenfranchised, uh, and they really have difficulty being able to manage um, the you know the day to day interactions with uh, individuals with um, uh, 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 in the community. I'd have to agree with that too. Um I meet many people living lives of quiet desperation and I think the key is to be really attuned uh, to someone and ask specific questions, to very gently ask about their past, um, to delve into things that they may not have been uh, open about because they have learnt to withdraw and they're a little bit frightened about it. Um, but just to really tune in that, that you know, these people still, even if they don't reach the diagnostic criteria, still need some intervention. And um, Chris, um, would you have a comment from your perspective as a general practitioner? Certainly. I, I think one of the one of the things that I, I'm, I'm hearing from Andrew, which I, I absolutely agree with, is that there is now a, a greater sense of hope, there's a greater sense of um, anticipation that even with no treatment a lot of people will improve. Um, obviously some people don't get to, to live that long. You know, If somebody completes suicide then that's uh, an opportunity lost. And But, but I think not only is there a, an awareness that there are a, a range of ways of, of helping, um, but I think it's, it's now seen that this is not a condition that remains constant or gets worse and worse. It is a condition that's very treatable and that, that has some, some complications that, that, are, that are also treatable. Thank you, um, Chris. And I, I guess now let's, I just wondered if we could swing from what helps to, um, it seems that sometimes we actually, as health professionals, make things worse. Um, and I wondered if each of you might very briefly make a mention of ways in which we might, I guess, cause eutrogenic harm. Look, I, I, I think I should probably put my hand up and, and, and acknowledge that there was a, a question in the, in the general chat about can we stop GPs from over-prescribing and uh, first I'd, I'd have to say that that can be a real problem um, so I'm not going to say no one ever gets it wrong. Um, I think one of the uh, really tricky things is that there are some 
GPs that are in a system where they aren't expected to spend a lot of time and a way of cutting short a consultation is to give a person a prescription and in this particular condition that that's very risky and very unhelpful. Um, I think bit by bit some GPs have picked up that they can do some additional training and get actually a bit better Medicare rebate for spending longer and using some specific psychological skills. Um, but yeah, that is a difficult thing. Uh, the other side of the coin is that, of course, this is partly because the person has such a lot of distress and they've tried to find ways of numbing the pain. Uh, in response to one of the other questions in the general chat, I just quickly looked up some stuff. And the um, one study looking at people with heroin dependence found that 38% of people seeking treatment for heroin dependence had borderline PD and antisocial PD. So in the in the drug dependence world, this, this is something we should be familiar with, used to, and we should be getting better at dealing with. I'd better let somebody else take over. Thanks, Chris. And um, I guess you've highlighted again the complexity of the and the ways in which people seek to, I guess, ameliorate their emotional distress. Could, could I so, just jump in there? Um, it's Andrew and uh, I think Chris has raised a really important point that often it's very difficult to sit with someone who's very distressed and feel like you don't have the right skills to to help them and that it is uh, tempting to reach for the prescription pad in those circumstances but I think there's another side to this which actually makes the task even more complicated and, and in my slides I was talking about trying to distinguish state from tray. The, the other area where people with BPD get shortchanged is that they get undertreated for very treatable mental state disorders. And so often when they have major depression or an anxiety disorder that people become, some people become quite stingy with treatment. Uh, and so I think it, it makes the GP's task very difficult in a short consultation. You know, psychiatrists have the luxury of more time to to talk uh, and try and tease these things apart. But you, you don't want to over-prescribe, but you also don't want to under-prescribe or under-treat in general. Uh, because there are, as, as you uh, have raised, many um, uh, hazards. Uh, and one of those is suicide, which you referred to. And, and we need to remember that about 8 to 10 percent of people with BPD will suicide and that there is a two decade reduction in life expectancy for people with, with severe personality disorder. So this is a very serious problem uh, that we, want, we don't want to uh, just assume we should never prescribe for. Thank you, Andrew. And um, I guess you've highlighted again that tension and the complexity, that the, the dilemma that we have um, and the importance of of not being one-eyed in our um, diagnosis. I guess one of the things that I wonder too is um, that perhaps you could speak to is what happens when we as health professionals um, become I guess, confused or start to respond to a message that perhaps we're special in contrast to another clinician, what um, impact that has. So you're asking me? It, I th look, I think uh, yeah, and that's a, a really um, uh, it's a it's a, a real uh, hazard with um, uh, with borderline personality disorder that we need to remember, as I said, to take our own pulse, and that sometimes uh, the uh, as Janina said, the uh, boundaries of the relationship can be blurred, uh, and that we need to. Uh, I guess ta take a take our own pulse, ring an alarm bell uh, when we're feeling like we're the only person who can solve their problems, or when uh, somehow we're told we're so special. Uh, and I think there's a tendency when that happens for people to run a mile, uh, or alternatively to get caught up in the relationship. And actually, a, a respectful discussion about how you're human. 
and that the potential for you to let that person down is just as much as any other. Uh, and then anticipating that you might and will let that person down and how are you going to handle that when that happens uh, without undermining your own competence at the same time. Those conversations are all important to have uh, up front when that starts to emerge. Thank and you, Andrew. This is, this is Chris. I, I think that's one of the things that's perhaps especially disturbing for a lot of non-specialist clinicians um, but but I, I, I think um, that whole experience that people with BPD may trigger powerful feelings in anyone they're talking to and, and doctors and psychologists and everyone else on this um, panel, we, we're not immune. Uh, at, at the same time, um, sometimes we've also got to be careful that if we're hearing the person say something critical of a colleague, uh, instead of saying, yes, I, I, I think they've done something bad, sometimes it's, it's important for us to actually get on the phone to the other person and say, um, what exactly did happen that day, or did you really do this, or just, just so that we um, present a bit of a united front and help the patient develop their boundaries as well. Thank you, Chris. And I guess that at this point it would be useful, um, Ellen, to hear briefly your reflection on these particular challenges and that um, the way in which we, or you might work as a mental health nurse, work together as part of a collaborative team. Yeah, I was thinking, because I work in two clinical areas, both inpatient mental health and um, and primary care, um, both basically a team and interdisciplinary. So the one in primary care, of course, uh, you start off with the three of you, if you like, and um, and refer on to either psychiatrist, psychologist, um, possibly social worker, um, if that's what's needed for their particular needs at any particular time. So. Talking about um, you know being that special person, I think we've all been there. We've all worked with teams that have had that uh, what they call the splitting behaviour, when some people feel that special relationship um, and other people only have the negative emotions instead. And uh, I think what's really really important is to keep that that um, that the person involved is the main focus, that not ourselves, um, to actually look at their needs. And to be, uh, I suppose, mindful of our colleagues when we're working with them, even if it's inter intermittently, like it might be in the primary care area, that uh, we all recognise those struggles and not be blaming or think that they're, or feel even, you know, why aren't we the special one? So it, it, it does need to, you, you do need to be open about it. You do need to recognise that it's going on and to be actually... Um, I suppose professional enough to broach it becomes a problem. Uh, and to not run a mile, I actually think in one way it's a reflection, yes, I've built a good relationship, they feel safe with me, that's great. Uh, but to be very open about it and open up the conversation immediately, I think it was Andrew or Christopher that mentioned it, that you broach it straight away, that um, yes, it's great that we can talk together like this, that we can work on things, but there are other people that you see who I know are also very helpful that you know, I can't be here all the time um, and I would like to think that there are other people that can work with you and uh, are, are able to help with you. So yeah, I, I think it, it, all the time it is, is really a responsible clinician who broaches these things with each other and with the person as well. Thank you, Ellen. And Janina, um, we'll give you a, a couple of minutes. There's so much to talk about here too. I guess from your perspective, not only with Spectrum, but also um, in your private practice, that the challenge of working across teams and collaboratively. Thanks. Um, look, I, I think we make it more complicated than we need to actually. Um, and I think that's because clinicians across services and across role aren't clear and tend to react emotionally to what's going on with the client. And I, and I think this idea of idolisation and devaluation which is being spoken about, you know, clients don't do this to us. 
because they wake up one morning and feel like they want to, you know, place us in a position that's um, in a much, you know, a much more perfect sort of state and, and the person yesterday was, was worse. It's all in, in relation to what they experience relationally and I think that we need as, as clinicians to be really mindful not to take this up as a personalization about our capacities or I'm not suggesting it's not easy. We've all been idolized and devalued and I, I agree with Andrew's earlier point. You articulate that and this is setting the, the again setting that contractual and relational engagement. You are going to disappoint the client and there's times they're going to think you're the individual that truly understands them and there's going to be days where they think you completely don't understand them. And I think one of the problems that then ends up happening iatrogenically is we start to invalidate in the face of that. So I think it's really important that we try to maintain a position of respect for the individual and understand that this is one of their core deficits. If they could do relationships better or if they could manage emotion more effectively, we wouldn't be seeing them. So you know, the way I manage it is I recognise that this is one of their core deficits. And my job is to help them to find a more effective way of getting their needs met. Because fundamentally that need for emotional connection and relationship is, is critical for all of us actually. It's not just for people with BPD. They just unfortunately have less skill because they weren't given opportunity to learn those, skill, those skills to be able to get their needs met effectively. So I guess that's sort of the way I approach it. Um, you, it yeah. yeah. Mm. And I, I guess that if as I listen to each of you and the, the various perspectives, there's that commonality amongst um, what you're saying and perhaps it goes right back to those very initial questions um, where um, Andrew and Janina, you both mentioned the importance of supervision. Mm -hmm. that, that ability to have a space where you can reflect and also have that space where you can, I guess, sit with your own experience is, is vital to be able to do this um, work effectively. I'd absolutely yeah. agree. Uh, and I think it's not just, sorry, it's Janina again. Um, I don't, you know, sometimes we can't access supervision for whatever reason. And I think it's really important to say, well, who else can I consult with? Particularly around when you're starting to get anxious around risk, you know, you consult with a colleague, whoever that might be. It might be a peer, it might be a peer sitting in a different agency. Um, if you can't get access to a supervisor. But I think the process of supervision is not just about reflecting on your emotional experience, but actually acknowledging and recognizing and trying to do something different about how is my emotion possibly becoming therapy interfering behavior on my part? What am I doing? How am I reacting? That actually may be limiting how I can do the best therapy that I can do for this person or best treatment. So I think it is a place to process, but it's also a place to really look at how you stay on track to provide good clinical care and treatment. Thank you. And I think that we might finish now by asking each of you um, to briefly suggest um, what other training might be um, available for those who want to learn more about how they can work effectively with this clientele. Um, Chris, could we start with you? What would you suggest? I suppose I'm more familiar with the training that's available to GPs and typically yep. it, it will be stuff that will fit in with their uh, quality improvement and professional development. Uh, and it depends. There, there'll be sort of little doses and big doses uh, for a GP that really wants to get much more involved. Uh, it, it's still a fairly small investment to do a 20-hour course. There, there'll be different things that are available just for a, a couple of hours. There'll be some things online. Um, I guess GPs would need to just look at what's on the College of GPs website or the College of Rural and Remote Medicine. And uh, but um, there'll, there'll be a range of different things and people need to also figure out what, what suits their personal style. Um, and yeah. I, yes, I, thank you. Um, and Ellen, have you got um, any a suggestion for 
Uh, I, I would have to say that um, the extra training I had in dialectical behaviour therapy is very, very helpful. Um, even if you don't use it as a, as a planned therapeutic approach, it, 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 I suppose it informs you how to approach the various, um, various difficulties that people with borderline personality uh, disorder might present with. And, uh, and, and, and other disorders as well. So the emotion dysregularity, um, the interpersonal relationships, uh, all those sorts of things. Um, so yeah, so that would be my, and, and there's many providers and it's something that um, I think is well worthwhile doing for, for nursing and, and probably um, most of the other um, professions as well. Thank you. And Janina, you've got to. Oh, look. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think um, for psychologists, it's really, a, it, again, I think um, Chris said it, trying to find the uh, treatment modality that works for you. You have to have adherence, so you have to be able to be genuine in your approach. So there is various trainings in DBT and ACT and MBT, there's a whole host. Spectrum offers some trainings um, in, in, in those areas if you're a mental health clinician. Um, you can you can access that. Um, I think I, my experience has been I have just gone after every training over the years that I have thought maybe was something that I could use, um, and then discriminated when I didn't find it helpful. And you know, for me, schema therapy and DBT are my preferred models of treatment. So um, I tend to gravitate to all those sorts of trainings. Um, I think the other thing is reading. There is copious amounts of textbooks out there on BPD and various treatments. Um, I think joining some organisations too. I, I don't know what Andrew thinks of this, but you know I'm a member of the um, European Borderline uh, Society and the International Scientific Study for Personality Disorder. Those sorts of avenues are fantastic as well for getting information and then sort of channeling your energies into the training that you would like to do. Um, but certainly gives you yes. up-to-date yes. research. Yeah. Thank you, um, Janina. There's just so much out there, isn't yes. there? And Andrew, <laughs> your final word from you before we wrap up for this evening. Sure. Uh, I think that um, it, there, are, there are different kinds, different levels of training that uh, I think everything from uh, training in basic knowledge about BPD, a lot of which is online, through to training in individual psychotherapies. I don't think you have to train in an individual psychotherapy in order to deal with people with BPD more effectively. I think it's important to tailor the uh, training that you do uh, for the task that, that um, you need to do. You know, as a GP, uh, you're not necessarily going to train in cardiothoracic surgery, but it does mean that you can still look after people with cardiovascular disease. Uh, and I think that... Uh, some of the training that uh, um, is available uh, online from the NEA BPD website uh, is very good. Uh, at Origin, we're the National Centre of Excellence in Youth Mental Health, and we offer training, uh, offer free training at uh, the Origin campus, and then also paid training in early intervention for borderline personality disorder. And we also run a training course in cognitive analytic therapy. Uh, and then there's also, uh, I would endorse what uh, Janina said, read books, uh, go online, get papers. Uh, and the International Society for the Study of Personality Disorders is also, I, I would say for enthusiasts, a very good um, uh, place to uh, uh, keep up to date uh, about the field. Thank you. And um, I'd like to thank each of the members of our panel this evening who've contributed so richly from their experience and if I was to, if I, as I reflect, I think one of the things that has really stood out for me this evening is that message of hope, that there is hope and this can be a much, uh, I guess, more um, positive story than that which we've been led to believe and Andrew's suggestion that we advocate for people with borderline personality disorder is so important as a clinician having spent quite a number of years um, with that as one of my prime focus. So I, I'm really aware of how much we need to be doing that and to spread that message of hope and to be able to respond in an effective manner. So I'd, I'd like to thank each of you for um, participating tonight and for um, 
linking in and I'd also encourage each of those who have been online to fill out the exit survey um, before you log off and you'll receive a certificate of attendance for this webinar within two weeks. There's also it will be a link to the online resources um, available for you. And I'd like to remind you that um, our next webinar on the 3rd of May will be supporting families of people living with dementia. I've also um, been asked to draw your attention to the possibility of setting up your own special interest network or join an, ex an existing one for people um, interested in working with people with um, borderline personality disorder. So the Mental Health Professional Network currently has interdisciplinary networks in Victoria and Adelaide and they're looking to expand into other states of Australia. So contact the um, network if you're interested in being involved. And before I close, I'd like to acknowledge the consumers and carers who have lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. Thank you to everyone for your participation this evening.